Hey, thanks for joining us today on the Jesus Famous Podcast. Today we're talking about why work is hard. We all know work is hard, but why is it so hard? And how do we live our work lives with joy and with hope for the future and with meaning and purpose? If you're tired in your work environment or are having a hard time finding purpose in what you're doing with your work week, then I pray that this conversation is helpful for you as we talk through different practices and frameworks for viewing our work, not just as work, but as worship to Jesus. Nate, so we're talking about work today. I'm curious, the burning question in my mind is, if you had your own personal robot, which are, these are coming soon. I've heard Elon Musk talk about it. What is the one piece of work that you would just give off to a robot? Oh my goodness. What's the thing you're just like, man, this part of work, this is like just too hard. I just don't want to do this part. (laughs) I have no idea, man. (laughs) That is the weirdest question. What could have, I bet it's just like, I'm, I just get stumped. Cause I'm like, what can a robot do? What would he be able to do? Anything I, a person can do. Anything a person can do. I don't know, Probably, I don't know. Emails. I don't know. Dude, that'd be incredible to have a personal robot. Just handle all your yeah, emails. Just keep my email at zero. Hey, there you go. Just give you the relevant info and then I don't need any more of it. There we go. There you go. The robot who handles email i'm sure that's probably an app yeah or maybe like the robot who hey just in 60 seconds or less tell me all the news i need to know about please just that's my news source make my my protein shake and (laughs) give me the news for the day (laughs) oh that'd be perfect man this message nate work is hard work is hard um for a variety of reasons that we'll get into but I'm so glad that we're talking about work. You know, I wasn't here last week for the podcast. Our buddy Daniel handled this with you last week Mm -hmm. and did a great job with you. Um, But I got to hear last week's message, uh, Why Work Matters. And now this week, jumping right into the hard part of it, Why Work is Hard, is I honestly, for me, it is refreshing. I know this is a hard message to hear because it's just like, oh, work is hard. I don't want to be reminded of that maybe. Um, but it is good to know because what you mentioned towards the end of the message is that Jesus truly is our hope for work, that everything we hope our work would do, the frustrations we have, the hardship we go to, it's ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And in heaven one day, our work will be so meaningful and yeah. really reach um, these beautiful. Yeah. It's kind ends. of like a, I, I, this is like a very half baked thought. I, there's probably some holes in this theory, <laughs> but you, you could potentially even just think about like what your work is aiming at and ask the mm-hmm. question when Jesus comes in all of his glory, will the thing that I'm working for be satisfied. Hmm, yeah. So like I think about a friend who's a chiropractor, you know, and like all day long he's trying to help people who hmm. their backs hurt, you know, somewhere along their spine, there's some kind of crazy pain. Right. And that's one of the hardest things physically for a human to go through. Hmm. And so he's trying to help them get better or at least just like the alleviation of some pain. When Jesus comes, what he's been working for will be fulfilled wow. and satisfied. People will be healthy and whole and we'll have our new bodies. And so it'll be great. And you know, obviously mm-hmm. like a worship leader, you know, I'm talking to one yeah. right now, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to lead people into the presence of God, help them experience God's presence and praise God, put words to and songs to mm-hmm. their heart so that they can articulate their praise to God. Well, in heaven, you're going to be so excited because your work will be fulfilled. You yeah. know, it will be satisfied. People will be praising God. I think about our, uh, the people in our church who are serving in the United States military, which is, yeah. you know, obviously struggling for a lot of uh, purposes and goals here on earth. But one of them is peace. You know, they want mm-hmm. to keep peace for, you know, ourselves 
uh, but also domestically, but also any threat that is foreign. They're trying to keep peace out there. Uh, for us, you know, many people have, have documented how the United States military is like one of the greatest peacekeeping and humanitarian organizations the world has ever known. But when Jesus comes, all of those dreams and aspirations for peace and harmony and justice, you know, they'll be meted out in that day. Right. So to kind of just be thinking about that, you know, in your work, it might help you uh, discern, am I doing good work today yes or am i engaged in something that maybe jesus is just really not about that to mm -hmm. any real strong degree like for instance obviously you know we've talked about work that just christians can't do yeah, like christians right. can't work in the quote unquote sex industry you know for instance uh, because when he comes there's going to be none of that that's fulfilled in his coming it will be abolished by his coming mm -hmm. so you don't want to be involved in that kind of wow. thing you want to be involved in those types of things that you know when he comes uh they're fully fulfilled sheesh what a great framework for thinking through work i love that hey let's talk about some of the things you mentioned in the message this week uh why why work is hard work is hard because of original sin yeah because adam did the thing Work is now hard. All blame is on him. No, I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll find out that's not totally the case. But I did notice that you mentioned about how work is frustrating, that there is just this constant kind of nagging within our souls a bit about work. It's, mm -hmm. never, all, it's never done. It's, there's always more to be done. And the things that we want to see happen a lot of times, we just don't get to see those things. Yeah. So there's frustration, and I wanted to ask you, Nate, you know, I, I think about people and even myself a lot of times, I've thought in the past, like, if my work is easy, then I'm on the right track. My work is at its best if it's easy. I'm in the right place if it's easy. But thinking about this and how work is frustrating, I'm curious if you have some insights on what are some of the metrics that we can maybe measure to see that our work is still at its best, even if it's frustrating. How else do we determine whether or not work is good and pleasing to God if it's just not easy, if it's still frustrating but not easy? Does yeah, that make so sense? work can, uh, when work is frustrating, it mm -hmm. can be a sign that we're in the wrong line of work, but it's not always a sign that we're in the wrong line right. of work because even the right line of work will have frustration attached to it because thorns and thistles, mm -hmm. it will bear for you. So we're going to experience the thorns and thistles of life and even the best workplaces in, uh, workplace environments on this side of eternity. And I love that concept or I love that truth partly because I think a lot of times we struggle with thinking that I must be doing something wrong yeah. or I'm in the wrong place if this is happening in my workplace. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. there's there's an issue with me or I've made the wrong choice, I've made the wrong mm -hmm. decision. They call it the paradox of choice, you know, that we live mm -hmm. in a time where you do have so many options. You know, I think it was uh, Barry Schwartz who wrote the book Paradox of Choice and he talks mm -hmm. about going in to buy a pair of jeans and he's like, when I was younger, <laughs> I'd walk in to buy a pair of jeans and it was just, here's my waist, length my, my waist size my leg length and I would buy a pair of jeans now there's so many options it can be paralyzing totally and I think a lot of people in this modern work climate we can get paralyzed mm -hmm. because we know there's other options we know there are so many different types of things that we can do and so the first second we feel the effects of the thorns and thistles mm -hmm. we might begin wondering did I choose wrongly? Should mm -hmm. I choose something else? Um, the, the thing about the curse in Genesis mm -hmm. chapter three is that they are not, um, it's, it's a description of what reality is now, mm -hmm. but they're not commands that we're meant to follow. In other words, let's take for instance, the first or one of the first parts of the curse it was to the woman we didn't mm -hmm. study this portion of right. the curse this last sunday but in that part of the curse god said in pain shall you bring forth children you'll have pain and childbearing so this was not something 
that apparently was part of original creation. Mm. Uh, procreation was going to be a painless experience. Then sin entered into the world, and now women forever have experienced yeah. a brutal pain in having children, having going through childbirth. Um, but that's not something that a woman then is supposed to say, all right, I got to obey that. I've got mm-hmm. to make sure that it hurts as much as possible. No, we right. do different things to try to mitigate that pain. So it might be through modern medicine. It might just be through relaxation. It might be through sitting in a tub of warm water, but mm-hmm. somehow, some way, I know for Christina, it was her husband taking a tennis ball and jamming it into her lower back while she was having contractions. You know, that was her way to try to mitigate the pain Mm. of the curse. So Mm -hmm. thorns and thistles in our work experience and environment, we're not just to lay down and take it. We're not just to say, all right, that's just the way it is. That is the way it is. It's helpful to know that so that we don't run away every time things are hard, but we are to be asking ourselves the question, okay, since that's the way it is, what can I do to mitigate that in yeah. my work environment? So maybe an answer to your question is if mm-hmm. you just can never mitigate that, you can never, you know, find a way to, to cultivate your workflow, your abilities, your talents, your education, your credentials, to be able to handle the thorns and thistles that are unique to that work environment, right. then maybe it's not the job for you. Hmm. So it's not so much the presence of the thorns and thistles that would cause you to look elsewhere. It's the inability to deal with them and handle them. I mean, literal That's thorns and thistles, a farmer would have to go out and pull up the weeds and maybe some uh, you know, weed killer, maybe some natural uh, ways of dealing with it, maybe some herbicide or something like that to, you know, kill it. But whatever, he's got to figure that out. And if he just can't figure it out, then potentially that's wow. not the place for him. So I think like in my uh, profession, you know, as a pastor of a church, it feels weird to call it a profession. It's a, you know, a ministry and a calling and all of that, but you know, it's a job like yeah, a work. lot of other people. Yeah. So I think about like, Hey, if you, you part of the thorns and thistles, like you're going to deal with complaints, you're going to deal with uh, sin and the church, you're going to deal with your own limitations of your, your talents and abilities. You're going to deal with Uh, monetary limitations. There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to deal with in that work environment. And if you're just like perpetually thrown off kilter by any comment that somebody makes, if you're just always super sensitive to, you know, a critical word that's spoken or something like that, and you can't deal with that Mm -hmm. thorn and thistle, then it might not be the thing for you. But mm-hmm. if you fi- can figure out ways to deal with it and, you know, have healthy outlets and, you know, I'm not saying wow. like go to one of those, what was that room you went to, Dan, before you <laughs> got married to Natalie, the, break the break room where you just pay 30, <laughs> you know, for a half an hour of just destroying things. Like maybe that's the way a pastor deals with it. But I don't think that's the healthiest way. Not every night and yeah. not at home probably. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So oh, you, I think you understand what I'm saying. I do. I love that. You know, the Proverbs say that if you can't handle pressure, then your strength is just too small. And I feel like that might be part of it, that there are different areas where we're strong. And I know for me, I've tried many different things where there was no strength (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I've found places where there is strength and God has kind of helped me narrow those things down. But what a great way of thinking about that. Um, just knowing how to handle those thorns and thistles. Let's talk about the aspect of how work is hard because of personal sin. You talked about the slothful person and the prideful person. And I wonder if we could talk about the slothful person first. When I was growing up, I always thought I was a really hard worker and fast. And it wasn't until I had a boss over me tell me like, hey, pick it up, pick it up where I was like, oh, I think I'm actually a slow guy. I didn't even know it. I just had all these blind spots. And I was like, oh, I think I'm actually a slothful worker. I just had no idea. And through discipleship and mentorship, 
things started to pick up a bit more. But for me, a big part of becoming a more diligent worker was receiving input, but also putting to practice what I heard Mm -hmm. and even coming into contact with some of those practices to learn how to become a more effective worker. And I was curious from you, Nate, speaking of just practices and learning how to become a more effective worker, do you have any suggestions for people who are maybe coming to realize, like, I might be a bit slothful. I'm not the most passionate worker, Mm -hmm. but I do want to become somebody who is passionate, who is motivated, who is diligent. What would you suggest to them as maybe some practices, um, habits, things to put into their life to help them become that kind of person? Mm -hmm. Your whole question and kind of the way you set it up, it it made me think of uh, something that I was considering this morning. Hmm. And I was just continuing out the thought of works sanctifying effect on our lives. And I think I've talked about it in my own life, Mm -hmm. the impact that work has had on me, the things that it's drawn out of me. But I was thinking about it from a different angle because I have teenage daughters who are beginning kind of that stage of their lives where they go out, they get jobs, they have bosses. And as a parent, it's a really refreshing thing because it's another person that's in authority in their lives, someone that's not me or their mother, um, helping hold them accountable And I just know how much it's going to grow them in their lives. And I just kind of was having the thought as I kind of extrapolated this out through (laughs) the universe, like how beneficial work is for us as a species. I was just thinking kind of my way of thinking about it or saying it is, yeah, because for most of us, the job our mom tells us we're doing Mm -hmm. is probably not really all that it's cracked up to be or that she's making it out to be, you know, mom tells us we're doing great and that we're, yeah, you know, just do your best, honey. You know, mom thinks we're just uber talented, (laughs) but we get to the job site, we get around other talented people and it's Mm -hmm. like, Oh wow. Maybe I'm not as great as my mom (laughs) said I was, you know, and I I think we all have that moment, you know, that reality uh, check coming into our lives. So, um, yeah, that sanctifying effect on our work. I think Dan asked me something similar to that last week about, you know, how can somebody improve in their work, grow in their yeah, work? And we're right. going to be talking in our next study about how to do good work. But for now, what I'll say is this. If you are in a position where you're saying, you know what, I think maybe I'm not as great of a worker as I could be or as I'd like to be. How can I get better? You can spend all this time, you know, going outside of your organization, listening to podcasts, reading the Bible, asking mentors, reading books about how to be a better worker. And all of that would be great. These are things that I like to do. But you can also go to your boss Mm -hmm. and say, I want to get better at this. Uh, What kind of guidance do you have for me? What books should I read? What classes should I take? Mm -hmm. What tutorials should I go through? How can I sharpen my skills? They might send you home with a couple of YouTube videos to watch Mm -hmm. that make you better at something. You know, they, they might send you home with a free online course that you can take to get sharper. Uh, They might just talk to you about showing up on time or like your energy level or your countenance. I remember having my, the pastor before me, when he was really like um, intentionally discipling me, mm-hmm. um, we got to a point in our relationship where it wasn't really so much me like inviting this in, but I had to be okay with it, where it was him really talking to me about the way I was coming off towards people, hmm. you know, and like my countenance, the way I looked, whether I looked approachable or didn't look approachable. Which, you know, that can be a real sensitive thing because you're saying to yourself, like, well, I I want people to talk to me. I'm not trying to be unapproachable. But he was just able to tell me, like, it doesn't matter what you want. You don't look approachable. You're not smiling when you're just, like, hanging out, you know, here at the church. You need to be doing that. Mm -hmm. And it helped me 
realize things about myself that I needed to grow in and improve. So that voice in your life, that person who's in authority over you, they've got something to offer you. You've got to humble out and open yourself up to it, but they can be a significant source of professional or workplace improvement Mm. if you invite it into your life. Man, that's super good. That humility piece, that being open to yeah. feedback is huge. I love it. I can't wait to get into that message. Do you say it's going to be next week or, or coming up about? It'll um, be the next study in the series. Yeah, the next study in the series. That'll be great. Let's talk about the prideful person, the person who idolizes their work, makes their work um, their God, places all their energy towards their work, neglects people because of work, all of that. I feel like there's been a a culture, I don't know if it's still like the thing right now, but when I was kind of getting like my grounding in ministry and um, I did a lot of photography work and video kind of work in that kind of environment, Mm -hmm. there's a big hustle culture. And like you work late, you work early, you work all day, try and get your portfolio and get people to notice you and everything. And it's, I found for me when I was doing a lot of that, I thought I was working hard and being diligent. This is kind of on the other end of being the slothful guy, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the other side of the pendulum. And uh, I was like, I'm working really hard. I'm burning the candle at both ends, making it count, you know. But I remember there was a moment where I felt like God was confronting that and letting me see that that was idolatry in my heart. I mm-hmm. thought I was doing something noble, but in a in effect, I was neglecting people and the Lord and my church and everything like that. Right. So I wanted to know, Nate, if you had some insight into that person who is idolizing work. Maybe they think they're working hard. Uh, maybe they think that they're just having, they're just being all in with their work. How do we not idolize work? How can we use work, like you said in the message, as a tool for worship? Yeah. Well, when you ask me this question, you, and you know this uh, personally, but just for the sake of everyone listening, you're asking Mm -hmm. a man who has one of those careers, one of those jobs that can easily swallow you up and Mm -hmm. become your identity. Totally. I mean, people refer to me as pastor when I'm just out and about, you know, I don't asked to be called that. I love when people just call me Nate, but I always respect however people Mm -hmm. are wired. And for some people, it's just, I can't refer to you that way. You're pastor Nate to me. Um, and because it's for the Lord, because it's, you know, biblical, because it's for the kingdom and you can kind of more easily tie the internal significance to it. Um, all of that is very easy for a pastor to begin to really take his position as his identity. And that's, this is who I am. You know, Mm -hmm. what I do is who I am. And, you know, I've known a lot of guys who when for whatever reason that um, function or that role has had to be taken out of their lives. You know, Mm -hmm. let's imagine, you know, nothing sinful, but just imagine for instance, a man who, you know, his wife becomes terminally ill or something like that, or she needs full-time care and he just can't Mm -hmm. lead the church like he used to. And he's got to step back from those pastoral responsibilities. It can be a real crushing thing for someone like that when they've placed their identity in the role and in what they do. And myself being a second generation pastor, Um, I've really had to make sure and and have wanted to my whole pastoral life kind of take stock of that constantly and make Mm -hmm. sure that my identity isn't wrapped up in what I'm doing. The other part of the question that you're asking, the reason why I think I might be able to say something about this and Mm -hmm. I haven't said anything about it yet is secondly, being a pastor is also one of those jobs that's never done. So you can keep hustling. You Mm -hmm. could be working until one or two in the morning every day and have more to do. Now the quality of your work is going to go down and all that kind of stuff. But there is 
always more to write, say, record, mm-hmm. teach, disciple, counsel, lead. There's always more right. that you have to leave undone at times. So there's never a day that goes by where when I am finished working for that day that I think, yeah, it's all finished. Mm-hmm. I, you know, There's always more to yeah. accomplish. There's always more to do. So how have I been able to handle that? One is just by really pressing into my relationship with God, because for me, that's where my whole identity is at. I'm a Christian first and foremost. I'm in Christ first and foremost. So I press into prayer and time in the word, not to get my pastoral um, stuff that I'm going to say to people, not to click or check a pastoral box so that I can say, I prayed so now I'm qualified to do my job. None of that. But just as a man, as a man before God, I have to spend time in his presence mm-hmm. regularly to remind myself of who I am. I'm not primarily a pastor. I'm primarily a child of God. Right. So going back to the gospel, mm-hmm. going back to the word, going back to prayer, that's really important. But I think a second thing that I would say about that is to, in a healthy space, acknowledge the healthy boundaries that are going to need to exist for me to continue to operate like I am primarily first a man before God who isn't only a pastor, but is also a husband, a father, a friend, and just a person. And to think through what would that look like in a healthy scenario? Mm -hmm. Because once that's designed, when I see myself, you know, there's always going to be days or seasons where you got to break past those boundaries mm-hmm. that you've set for yourself because it's a season of intense work yeah, or something right. like that. But in general, when you see that trend over and over again, man, I just keep blowing through the yeah. time I said I'd come home to Christina. Mm-hmm. I keep blowing through the amount of times I said I would speak in a calendar year. I keep blowing through like uh, taking a day off and I'm like actually just reaching out and doing more ministry. I keep blowing through all that. When you see that as a pattern, it helps you to be able to identify, okay, I think my identity is all wrapped up in what I'm doing right now and I need to take a step back. So that might be a helpful way for people to diagnose that in their own lives. Yeah, absolutely. You can get a real quick feedback on it too by your spouse or your kids or your roommate or as closest to your life group people as well. Hey, let's wrap this up, Nate, by um, just considering the person who's made us feeling like really worn out with their work. They're Mm. like, yeah, I get it. Work is super hard. They're like, I, I didn't need this study yeah. to tell me that. <laughs> I know. I know it is. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for that person? I, I know we both know people who are feeling overworked, who are tired, who have a lot on their plate. And um, some of it's by design. Some of it's because of what has happened to them, whatever it might be. Their, their lives are full and work is full for them. Do you have any amazing encouragement for that person to keep moving forward? Yeah. You know, the Lord loves you guys. He cares about you. He sees your pain, your toil, your struggle that you're in. Jesus identified with us. He became one of us and he became a worker like us. And he probably, for the most part, had a work job career that was a lot physically, a lot more physically demanding than any of us have endured or experienced. But He knows, he knows our pain, but even on top of that, you know, some of us, especially in the knowledge industry might say to ourselves, man, you know, there's days I'd love to be a carpenter in Nazareth. I'd love to be just working with my hands and just physically using my body because my mind is just so overwhelmed. There's so many tasks, responsibilities, duties that I've got to keep up with and follow up with. And the channels of communication are so complicated and I'm working in a bureaucratic nightmare and mess. I would love to leave all of it and just go work with my hands. 
But Jesus also understands what it's like to be vexed mentally and emotionally. Mm -hmm. He experienced the pressures of so many people needing him, wanting him, needing his time and his energy and his space. And then, of course, when he went to the cross, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And I think that when he did become sin for us, he tasted all of the mental anguish that we go through as human beings. So the comfort that I have for you is that you do have a God who understands and has experienced what you are experiencing to a worser degree than you. And there is no other religion. There is no other message where the deity, the divine, the holy, the transcendent Mm -hmm. also has condescended and understands us and who we are and our daily experience. So know that he, when he says he's coming back, he's in part coming back to rescue you from all of that. And, you know, I'm not trying to overly dramatize it and say, you know, Hey, I know when that sixth day of work and that big long shift managing that local Jamba juice, when it happens, don't worry, Jesus is coming back. (laughs) He'll get you out of that crazy, terrible place. I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but there's something comforting about that. Mm -hmm. Christ is going to come and establish his kingdom. And just to know that he sees you, he's praying for you, and that he has grace and mercy for you for today. Uh, I hope that's a comfort to some of you that are out there. But you're right, man. There's a lot of people that have gigs that you know, I'm not jealous of, you know, the yeah. work is really hard. And I think especially as I think about our congregation here in Monterey, I think about those who um, are, you know, every church has all different types of people, you know, and I think about those people who have the challenges of being self-employed mm-hmm. and the, the whole thing, the weight of the world feels like it's on their shoulders because uh, it, it's on them to produce that income, the new clients, the new patients, you know, whatever it might be. Or I think about those who are part of our church, who are working for the military, you know, and it's, I realize that the time in Monterey can be a little bit of a change of pace, a nice change of pace to not be deployed during that season, but studying. But even those studies can really be challenging, you know, and learning a new language or getting your degree uh, in something advanced that's challenging. Uh, You know, that can be a hard thing for a person to go through, especially when looming is the move that you're going to make or the deployment you're going to go through. Or I think about those who are doing, you know, all the construction and building in this area and the high demands that people make on the quality of your work. We've got so many people in our church that are involved in the social system and operating, serving as counselors. I mean, there's just so many lines of work that where there, there's just really significant mm-hmm. pressure that's attached to them. Just know that it's normal. You're not doing that's anything good. weird or wrong. It's just the way that it is. But one day it won't be. Amen. Well, thank you, Nate, for this message and for talking with us today. Can't wait for the next installment in the series. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. We pray that today's discussion has blessed you. For more information and to take the discussion further, you can visit nateholdridge.com for additional articles and content. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, and share so we can continue to reach people and make Jesus famous in our lives and the lives around us. Until next time, God bless.